sunrise on another glorious spring day. And the morning warmth creates the sparkle of dewdrops on the heath. Our female sand lizard takes advantage to quench its thirst. With a lizard's tongue as an opener, you can only be watching one thing. Oh yes, it's Spring Watch. Welcome to Spring Watch 2023, coming to you live from the beautiful RSPB Arne Reserve down here in Dorset. We're going to be on for the next three weeks. It's a festival of wildlife. Our mission, as usual, is to bring you the very best of the UK's wildlife, but also this time to talk about collaboration, where people and agencies work together to improve the whole landscape for that wildlife. And this is the perfect place for that, because this is the first super national nature reserve. A super superb mix of different habitats all linked together. It's down here in the south of England on the Isle of Purbeck, called the Isle of Purbeck, despite the fact it's not an isle. Well, not now. But this is Sandy Lowland Heath. Plenty of specialists here, along with generous like foxes, of course, and deer. But the things we've really come to see are things like Dartford warblers and night jars, birds of dry, open habitats and there was plenty of those here. So we're very excited to be down here looking at all of these species. We started strong last night, I've got to say. We had a displaying nightjar and sand lizards, but tonight we're going heavy on the science. We're going to introduce you to the pterygoid walk. You can't do that, can I, you? I can do it, a sort of pterygoid walk, uh, something like that. It's a very <laughs> crude approxima uh, approximation, but we'll be coming back to that a bit later. Now, we're going to be focusing today on something that Arne is well known for, not the heath itself, but creatures that live in and on the heath, reptiles. And this is the, one of the few places in the country that you can get to see all six of UK's reptile species. So we thought we'd start, well, first of all, I'm gonna say that I, I try and go and see all six of them yeah. later on. I, I set myself a little challenge yeah. um, and we'll see how I get on a bit later on. But let's start with one of the rarest reptiles. And it's one that you saw right at the beginning of the show. And I know what you're thinking, it's a different colour. Well, this is the male. It's in its breeding splendour. Look at that emerald green, absolutely stunning. That's the female, much duller, brown colour. They've mated already, and now the female is looking for somewhere to lay her eggs. She's prospecting on a burrow. She tries a few. She's got to get the perfect temperature, humidity, texture. It's got to be damp warm south facing look at that belly though gravid it's gravid it's full of eggs so she's definitely ready to lay those eggs down she goes checks it out as she comes out you can see that she definitely hasn't laid the eggs because she's still got a full belly she'd be much thinner if she'd lay them she'd be much thinner when she comes out like you were I didn't lay any eggs, Chris. I certainly didn't lay any eggs. But yes, you know, it's exactly right. After you've given birth, you're... We're not the out. only ones who've been out and about looking at wildlife. Martin Stratford had a trip camera on a stream near his home, and he sent this fantastic footage. Family of badgers, female and two cubs. She's trying to get them across the stream. But the cubs, as you can see, don't take easily to the water. In fact, they don't like it at all. But she's determined. So she carries one of them across to the other side. The other tentatively makes an investigation, but thinks better of it and heads back. The female badger then goes to retrieve the other cub. Things don't go according to plan because the one she's already carried across follows her back to the original side of the stream. I've got to tell you, well, I don't need to tell you, the young badgers aren't very happy about this. Seven times the female, Chris crossed the stream trying to get them over. You might think they're both over here, but they're not. The other one is still on the other side and when she goes to get it, Back it goes again. 
Fantastic stuff. Really, really good I little love story it. there. The noise. It's incredible. I know. I don't isn't blame it? those baby badgers. Who wants a soaking wet belly <laughs> in a cold stream? Great footage, though. So please keep sending your videos in and your photographs as well. Okay, let's go over to the map. Show you exact. Gosh, the wind is picking up. I hope this doesn't blow off. This is on. You can see it's a huge area, and you can see all these different habitats around. And also, these are all the different birds and nests that we've got cameras on. We've yeah, got the oyster catcher up here. There. Look, we featured the Dartford warbler, didn't we, yesterday? Uh, what else have we had? Well, we've got a few new ones oh, as yeah. well that I'm just about to introduce you to. But first of all, let's have a look at the variety that we have. These are all of the different nests. Uh, you can see the oyster catcher at the top there, but I'm going to take you to a new one. I'm going to take you to look at the wren. It's very difficult to see the wren itself because you can see this is a dome-like nest. Oh, you can just about see the little chick poking its head up. Don't know how many are in there. We probably won't until they're a bit bigger and they're poking their little faces out. Let's have a look at our buzzard. We did check in with a buzzard yesterday. We know there are two chicks in there hunkering down at the moment. One of the adults is there being very well fed. Hopefully we'll have a look at those a bit later on. And this one, I love this one, Chris. This is the gold crest nest. Very well camouflaged in that ivy, an absolutely gorgeous nest. And oh, we can see one of the adults there feeding the chicks. Again, because it is such a difficult nest to look into, we won't know how many chicks are in there until they get a little bit bigger. But now we're going to have a look at one of the nests that actually isn't in on itself. It's on Pool Harbour and the remote camera is being controlled by birds of Pool Harbour and it is a nest we showed you yesterday, the osprey nest. A very exciting nest because this is the second successful breeding of osprey on the south coast in the last 200 years. Two adults there, 022 and CJ7. And last night we saw one of the three eggs starting to hatch. This is what happened after that. The male comes in, look at that instinct. The male is trying to feed the chick inside the egg. It wasn't terribly successful. 10.36, we get the first peak of this very, very special osprey chick. Look at that. And then in the morning, it peeks out under the warm feathers of the adult, absolutely gorgeous. As the adult flies off, we get a really good look at this little chick. Hasn't quite got its coordination together, tumbling all over the place. CJ7 comes back in and you can just see that second egg. It's got a little hole on it, it's starting to hatch. She keeps the chick and the eggs warm as the male comes in. And this is the first feed for this brand new and very, very special chick. And look how gently the female just tears little bits off and feeds them to that now dried off chick looking a lot more fluffy. So there's one chick successfully hatched. The other one has started to hatch. The third egg was laid six days later than the first. So it's likely that if it does hatch, that it might hatch in a few days' time. But as I say, that's an incredibly special nest. Everyone is extremely excited. Lots of celebration. Fantastic piece say, of... the second successful breeding of those ospreys. Yeah, a, a, a fantastic piece of proactive conservation going on here. Birds of Paul Harbour and the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation amongst the leading partners bringing these birds back to this area. Fantastic. Now, look... I'm not going to rival ospreys for glamour and rarity, but I'd very much like to show you our oyster catcher's nest. I mentioned it yesterday because it's a slightly unusual nest. Well, it may not look unusual, that's a typical oyster catcher sat on a typical beach, but let's see what's underneath it because there are not the typical three eggs. It's sitting on a clutch of six eggs. Now look closely. If you look there, you'll see that there are two patterns. There are some broad, boldly spotted eggs and then some thinner less spotted eggs and if we can mark those you'll see them really clearly so there are what appears to be two eggs uh, two clutches of eggs laid into the same nest here let's take a look at what these oyster catchers have been up to now what we've seen is two birds in attendance but that's not necessarily of course two females because the males will incubate and brood those eggs as well 
uh, the young when they hatch, I should say. So here they are at nest changeover. Why are there six eggs in the nest? It could be egg dumping. So another female has come in and dumped those eggs in there. Maybe she couldn't get a territory, maybe she was young and in inexperienced, or it could be a case of polyandry. Polyandry is where one male has more than two females. Now, typically, that would mean two nests, not two nests fused together like this. But uh, in 2011, Dr uh, Clive Craig from the Scottish Marine Institute published a paper which told us no less than 13 species of seabird egg dump like this, and oyster catchers are at the top of that list. So it's unusual, but it's not that uncommon. But we'll keep our eyes peeled to see what happens. And, of course, if you want to keep your eyes on all of our live cameras, you can do so from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, and you can watch them all on our website. It's going to be really interesting to see if all those eggs hatch or whether it's just the three that the female Well, the trouble is that, you know, the, the, what, the male or the female that's trying to incubate them can't, isn't big enough to cover yeah. all of them. And there are always some left outside, which is one of the reasons why this egg dumping isn't a great strategy when it comes to getting your genes in the next population. Right, we're down here somewhere. I think we're about there, aren't we? <laughs> in the wind of the heathland. Let's go to Megs, who's over here. She looks like she's on the beach, but actually it's not the sandy beach, is it, Megs? <laughs> No, I mean, it's not quite a sandy beach. I'm actually in the middle of the heathland, but I'm at a sand bank and I'm actually quite sheltered and the sun's gone in. But earlier on, when I stepped onto this sand bank, I could literally feel the heat. And that's because sand as a habitat is very good at almost absorbing that heat and retaining it, which means then it's very good for all different kinds of life forms. So we sent out our wildlife film team to come and scout out what they could see here on the sand. What we found, we weren't necessarily expecting. So here we've got some wood ants and their nest isn't too far away from me now and they are climbing this mountain of a sandbank. Or to them at least it's a mountain. And you see the effort they put in and wipe out. Off you go. It's really hard for them. Obviously those grains of sand are almost as big as them and they're struggling. But they are persistent, which means there's got to be something worthy at the top as a reward. It's got to be energy efficient and if you look there, what you'll see is a black ant, a much smaller black ant. So essentially these wood ants, the larger ones, have found a black ant's nest and they've decided to raid it. They're young, the black ants themselves, uh, and even their food supplies. So there they are, nestled into the black ant nest, taking everything they possibly can, filling their very powerful jaws up and scuttling back down the mountain. And I'm really pleased to say that actually uh, that drama was still going on just a few moments ago when the sun was out. They were running over my shoes with black ants in their jaws. So, you know, I feel part of the drama myself, which is, you know, quite nice. But it wasn't actually necessarily what we were after. We were looking for bees. Now, come and have a look up here. What you'll see in the sandbank here, which actually I have to say was man-made by the RSPB, are all of these holes. Now, they're no longer in use, but they are the holes of solitary bees and wasps. Now, we have about 275, roughly, species of bee in the UK, and about 70 of those are mining bees. And they're really, really important. Now, we know that nationwide and indeed globally, our pollinators and insects are in a lot of trouble, and they need a bit of a helping hand from all of us. And there is so much that we can do at home, in our gardens, in our buildings, to really make that difference. And I thought I'd invite you for a seat at my craft table to have a look about how we can do this. Now, typically you can get a, a bee hotel that looks something like this, and you've got these bamboo shoots, and typically the solitary bees will come in, they'll lay an egg, put a pollen store, close it up, and then repeat the process. And a couple years later, the young bee will emerge. And this is a great for many different kinds of bees, but we've got to include all different bees that like different types of habitat. So here is my first example, one I made earlier. Uh, this is simply a flower pot. At the bottom, I put some pebbles, and then I used about a one-to-one -one ratio of kind of clay soil and sand to fill it up. And then all you simply have to do after that point is get a pen and put some holes in it like this. Now, the reason why I'm putting holes in it, although that's not a very good one, um, is because they like to actually nest in kind of clusters. They like to brood together. That's where they know it's safe. That's where they know, you know, they're going to be doing well. So if you put a few holes in it, they'll think, oh, other bees are there. I may as well come and put my egg in there too. Um, so might, they might be solitary, but they do like to 
lay their eggs in a, in a cluster, as I said. And one bee that loves to do that is the ashy mining bee. It's a really beautiful bee. This was sent in by Mike uh, Blacknell. It's gorgeous, it's got this white face and it's quite common in our gardens, whether you live in an urban environment or indeed within the countryside. Um, so wherever you are, this is a great thing to do, a great activity to do at home. But not all bees like that really soft, sandy substrate. Some like to, well, lay their eggs in a bit of a harder hole, shall we say. Uh, and we were sent in this clip. Take a look at this. This is the wall of a, a building or a house, I presume. But what you'll see, this is filmed in South Oxfordshire, is hairy footed flower bees. Now they really like those kind of hard places to put their eggs and essentially with new buildings and stuff there are less crevices anymore for them to come in so we need to make sure there's more room for these hairy footed flower bees. Look how beautiful that is, really gorgeous bee. But there is a way that we can help them as well. So I have my ingredients here, I have some clay soil again, I've got some sand and I've got some hay. Now I've already mixed it up. Uh, so the majority of this needs to be the soil and then just kind of a handful of sand and a handful of hay and this is where it gets fun. So I need my binding agent, which in this case is water. You pour that in like this, right? Roll up your sleeves because it's going to get mucky and you mix it all together, squelch it all up. Oh, doesn't that look good? Make sure it's all nicely mixed in to create some kind of, well, I guess sort of like a natural cement. Pop it on a table like this and squidge it together to resemble a brick. Now, after I've done about that, you want it to be about kind of six to 12 centimetres deep. So it needs to be a bit deeper. There we go, like that. And then you put your holes in it, quite narrow holes. It's important that the holes aren't too big um, and that will encourage them to come in again. Oh, doesn't that all look good? But leave it to dry in the sun for a little while. And here we are, like magic. I have my brick here. And this is something that's so easy to do. We can all do it in our gardens, for our houses, wherever you are. And especially, you know, whilst we've got kids off school, half term, wherever you are, whether it's this week or next week, it's a really brilliant thing to do. Look at this, a bee brick. We can all help our pollinators. Now it's time to move up north to Gillian in North Wales. Gillian, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be making these all over my house. I hope you are too. I think I'd be tempted to eat them if I actually made them. You made that look so good, Megan. Well, welcome to North Wales. We are on day two of our journey through this absolutely amazing place. Last night, we were up on the mountain. We were on a site called Dolbardown Castle, and that was right up in the mountains. And today we've traveled south, we've headed down off the mountain, and we are at Gwynedd powder, Gwaith powder even, an amazing site. And what a difference a day makes because we were surrounded by mountains and today we're surrounded by this beautiful woodland. But this area is right along the Afon Duirid, the River Duirid, and it spills out into a sandy tidal estuary and the steep-sided valleys of Gwaith rise up to form this patchwork of habitats of heathland, of grassland and of woodland. And a few days ago, I got the chance to explore this area really well and find out a little bit about its explosive past. These wild woods and the windswept heath here at Gwaith Powder hide a somewhat fiery history of this site. Now, on a beautiful afternoon like this with sunshine and birdsong and dappled light, it's really hard to imagine what used to go on here in North Wales. Just a few decades ago, this site was a world-renowned explosive factory. Now, I bet you weren't expecting that. Gwaith Powder is now a nature reserve managed by the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Since they took over in the mid-1990s, nature has reclaimed this once industrial landscape. Luke Jones is the reserve's officer, and he's here to introduce me to some of the site's star species. You must love your job. A place like this, a day like today, but I understand it didn't always look like this. Yeah, so the Cook's Explosives factory was here until the 90s until it was donated to the North Wales Wildlife Trust. During the time of the factory, there weren't many trees there for fire safety reasons. So all of these birch trees have regenerated naturally during that period. That is incredible. So in about 25 years, all of this, or most of this has come up. Yes, yeah, so it's on its own and it's completely transformed the site. 
So this is nature yes. reclaiming the land back. That is absolutely yes. incredible how quickly, relatively, that seems to have yes. happened. Okay, so why have you brought me here? So this is one of the remaining factory buildings that was purposely selected for its potential as a bat roost. And now it's one of the main bat roosts on the site. And there's a population of rare lesser horseshoe bats that live in here. So in the, in the 90s, after it became a, a reserve, they demolished oh, wow. many of the factory buildings and detoxified the area. So these ones were left. This was the actual building where a lot of the explosive work was going. What's all this here? So these are the blast walls made out of hessian sacks filled with cement. Yeah. So they would have directed the blast upwards in case of uh, any accidents to stop any explosives spreading around the site. Wow. And now they're, they're starting to fall apart and nature is slowly reclaiming the buildings. The lesser horseshoe bats that call this former explosive warehouse home are one of our more threatened species. They're now confined to the west of England and here in Wales. They're incredibly sensitive to disturbance, and so places like Gwaith Powder are vital for their survival. Not only do they have shelter at the reserve, the reclaimed woodland is alive with insects for them to feed on. Another species that takes advantage of this abundance of invertebrates travels all the way from Central Africa to call Gwaith Powder home, the pied flycatcher. So tell me why this is a particularly good spot for the, the flycatchers. Yeah, so the pied flycatcher's preferred habitat is in oak woods mm -hmm. and also in birch woods as well. They do. So there's a mix of those two woodlands here, quite powder. There it oh, is. there it is. I can't. Oh, wow. And then it's just gone off. Yes, away, that's the male. So that was the male? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. And it's so peaceful here, and we're getting drawn in, obviously, by all the nature around us and all the wildlife. But I'm reminded that this is, you know, a place where so much explosive material is sent out around the world. Isn't yes. that right? Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of activity here, and the, in World War II, there was 17 million grenades were produced here for the, yeah, for the war effort. Wow. So this should have been a big hub of activity, and a, you know, big part of the local community. And now it's totally different. It's a place for the locals to come in and relax in nature. Yeah. What a lovely tour that evening was with Luke. It was fascinating to learn about the history of the site, but also the natural history. And we're going to be catching up with those pied flycatchers later in the week. But later tonight, we're going to be looking at this beautiful habitat, the ponds and pools of Gwaith Powder, and looking at the aquatic life that is making a home here. Nature bouncing back is our theme for tonight, and it's certainly true in Purbeck at the Purbeck Super National Nature Reserve. And earlier, Michaela joined licensed reptile surveyor Gary Powell to do a survey of all six of Britain's reptiles. Gary, what is it about the history of this heath that's made it so good for our reptiles? So for many years, they've been extracting clay from it. So over the years, they've developed this, this series of pits, ditches and ponds that's really, really good for, for wildlife and has really helped the, uh, the habitat for the reptiles that are on site. There are six native reptiles in the UK, three snakes and three lizards, and they can all be found here. You just have to know where to look. Oh, there we go. I guess that's that's where we're looking. You've yeah. put that out, haven't you? This is what. Well, yeah, this is something we put out as part of our monitoring program. So we want to get a, an idea of what animals we've got on site, their distribution across the site, and this helps us with some of those more secretive species like smooth snakes. I'm feeling lucky. We should say at this point, if you're wandering around here, please don't lift these things up. Yeah, it's okay. it's, it's potentially dangerous for the animals because if you lift the tin, you've then got to put the tin back, and if the animals move slightly, you could squash it. And you don't want to disturb them. And you don't want to disturb them any more than necessary. Okay, fingers crossed. There's a lot of build-up for this. It might just be ants, of course. No, come on. You're, you've promised me something. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah that's really great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the first site. I mean, you, you never want to find something straight these, away. These things are never easy. Wow! We've got a grass snake here. We've got, a, we've got a smooth snake there. Oh, that's just fantastic. 
Do you want to handle the grass knife for me? Okay. You're right with these. I'm all right with that, am you're, I? You're okay with me because I've got a license. Yeah. They're always quite active when you first catch them. The defence mechanism for these is sometimes they pretend to be dead, which this one clearly isn't doing. And coupled with this smell, probably quite effective as a defence mechanism. So where's that coming out of, that smell? So this is, comes from an anal gland. From the gland anal gland here. down here? Yeah. I actually got to quite like it, but... No, it will never are you serious? It'll never catch on as a perfume. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's really horrible, Gary. Should I put this one down now? Yeah, if we let yeah? that one go. OK. Under there. Nothing to do with the fact that it's, you know, I've had enough of its smell. There we go. Off he goes. So let's have a look at this one. This is a smooth snake, Britain's rarest reptile. Found really only in Dorset, Hampshire, Surrey. They're quite um, fussy, aren't they, with their habitats? Yeah, quite, quite reliant on certain habitats and, and climate. So you were saying the rarest, but here might be the easiest of the reptiles to see? Yeah, on this site, we're, you're never guaranteed with reptiles, but we've always got a really good chance to find these here. Two snakes already, what a great start. Only the adder to find. Every reptile discovery provides invaluable data for the survey. Mm, no. Nothing under that one. But also not finding anything... Very soon as the last one. Yeah. ..is just as useful. There's nothing there. ..as it helps them assess the populations here. Right, there's a male sand lizard basking here, just beyond this. You see the gorse? Oh, the really bright green. Bright, bright green. So oh, that's that a male. beautiful emerald colour. Yeah, it's incredibly vivid, isn't it? How long does it have those vivid colours so for? Once they've bred, the, the colours will fade, and then towards the end of the year, they'll look sort of yellowish. Oh, look at that! Wow. <gasps> there we are. The slow worm! Slow worm. Oh, look at those colours. And that is the bluest slow worm I've ever seen. Really? That's amazing, yeah. I've... You occasionally get them with little blue spots, but that one's stunning. And I think they're really underrated, because they're considered common. They turn up in gardens a lot, compost heaps. They're often mistaken for snakes, so it's a legless lizard. One of their defence mechanisms is that they've got the ability to drop their tails. The predator goes for the moving piece of tail that falls off, and the slow one lives. This one has lost its tail in the past. You can see that healed over end to it, that black tip. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's healed over, so at one point the tail would have been a lot longer than that. Within just a couple of hours, we've already found four species. Oh, <laughs> there we are. Oh, they spotted ah. it at the same time. Yeah, Look are. at that. It's, it's, a, it's a common lizard. It's a common lizard. Despite the name common lizard, I mean, they're not as common as they used to be, are they? No, we think all our reptiles in this country are declining to some degree. Um, part of our monitoring programme is to find out and to what degree uh, and what we can do about it. And I guess the reasons are the same as all, most other things, loss of habitat, yeah. fragmentation, that's right. climate change, yeah, pesticides... All things. those things combined, that's, that's what does the damage. I've got to say, though, I wasn't hopeful that we'd see all, <laughs> all six of our reptiles. We've seen mm. five of them, which just goes to show how important and how precious this heathland habitat is. Five out of six, not bad, I suppose. Five out of six, but do you know what we did see that we didn't show? What? Was we saw the shed skin of an adder. The so shed that, skin yes, of that's an adder. Sort of six I out saw of the six. shadow of an eagle. <laughs> Where is the shed skin? Where's the evidence? We left it there. You didn't leave it Part there. No the one leaves a shed skin there. They collect it to give it to children to introduce them to nature. You made the whole thing up. You saw five out of six. No, but we did. We did honestly see proof of the six reptiles, which was amazing because we were only there till just after. After lunch. Well, I do that tick, 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 tick. So you did a half day, tick, which tick, is why you only scored you know five what? out of six. You could have gone on and found the other one had you worked harder. You hate it when I win, don't you? But you know what? With all those reptiles, that does pose a little bit of jeopardy for our nest because on past watches, we've seen a lot of predation from snakes of the chicks and the eggs, haven't we? We have. But that's not all they ate, of course. Chicks, eggs, fish, amphibians, small mammals, in fact, whatever that fits in their mouth, which is somewhat larger than it might seem. Take a look at this. I mean, that is quite difficult to work out what's going on there, but it's a snake-eating 
a frog. I mean, the frog is going down whole and you can see it's somewhat bigger than the snake's head. How does it do that? Well, first of all, let's have a look at right. this incredibly... Let me give you that. You've got to be really careful with that because Listen, it's a windy day and you cannot drop it. This is a very precious specimen. This is the skull of a grass snake. We borrowed it from Bristol Museum. I'm absolutely gripped with envy. It is absolutely stunning. Grip with envy, but grip onto it. Yeah, I'm say, hanging we don't want on to, to a little bit of cotton off. thread. Yes. <laughs> but you can see, I mean, you can see how small the jaw is. In width-wise, it's two centimetres. Right. And that frog would have been about six centimetres. So how does a head that's three times the size of the width of the jaw manage to get down into the mouth? What a skull. That is amazing. Hey, it's a look at it. Look, you see put the little teeth. Can you see the little teeth in there? Look at those sort of gripping teeth in there. All facing slightly backwards. Do you know what? We're going to post this back to Bristol Museum. It could easily get lost in the post and <laughs> re-delivered to my place. <laughs> Go in, I'll tell you what, I'll take that then, okay, so you don't look, take it off. Nick, let me explain how the uh, snake skull works. But it's not like our skull, particularly the lower jaw. You see, ours is fused here, but the snake's isn't. And, uh, Mick, if you remove the grass snake's face here... Yep. Right, here is the lower jaw, and the first thing to say is that it isn't fused together at all. So that allows the jaw to separate like that, the two pieces of the lower jaw, thus giving it a greater width. But it's more than that, I have to say, because what I can show you here is that using this bone here, it is able to distend the jaw downwards like that. So rather than only being able to open its mouth wide, like this, it can distend the jaw even further to increase the height, if you like, of, of its mouth, which is pretty sensational stuff. And you can see it in action here. Here is a grass snake swallowing a great crested newt using its what we call its macrostomatum skull. And you can see that it's swallowing that newt down. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll put their glottis, their windpipe, if you like, out of the side of their mouth if the prey is sufficiently large so that they don't choke in the process of swallowing it. Now, you may have heard in the past, of course, that people say that they dislocate their jaw. It's simply not true. If they were just to dislocate their jaw, it would damage them. You can't damage yourself just to eat. So what you do is you have those extraordinary adaptations. Now, that's enough for getting a big thing down. But how do you actually swallow something which is sticky or slippery like a frog or a newt? Well, you need to employ the pterygoid walk. Can well, you do that? Well, I can do it as it sort of, as I say, this is a sort of clue. Right. But I think we can demonstrate it better on this rather marvellous prop that we have here. OK. OK. Right, you be uh, the prey at the top. And here we have the grass snake here. And I'm going to operate it from uh, the uh, back here like this. So what happens is the grass snake finds its prey. It then climbs up and it seizes it. So it's got hold of it at this point in its widened mouth using that greater gape, but then it needs to be able to grip it and swallow it. And what it does is it, it protracts one side of the jaw and then retracts it like this. So it basically walks its face and its skull and its jaw onto the toad. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> what a prop that is. Come on, we've got to have another go. Come on, Come on that let is me withdraw that. Isn't brilliant. that sensational? So, one thing that I can tell you whilst I'm repeating this remarkable thing is it <laughs> grabs the toad, there we are like that, and then it starts to walk its skull on. So this very flexible skull, held together by elastic fibres, is able to swallow that. Only a couple of bits remain virtually intact, and that's the bit around the brain case here, around the snout and around the eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the BAFTA of <laughs> props, the BAFTA, the Oscar of props, courtesy, of course, of Lucy Latwing. And we salute her genius. This is superb, honestly. We ought to put that on the website. <laughs> you oh. can make one yourself at oh, home. what about that? Isn't that that good? was a beautiful thing. Let's go to Megs. Megs, what do you think of that? Have you got anything that can even come close to this prop? <laughs> oh, wow, well, it was a pretty good prop, wasn't it? But... 
I think I've got something to rival it. Well, I think I've got something. I'm sure Leif will tell us all about it. So I'm really, ploy really pleased that this series we're going to be joined by Leif Bursweden, who is our resident botanist, because of course we've got some amazing reptiles, we've got some amazing birds, but we cannot forget about the plants. Absolutely not. They're so exciting and I'm so excited to tell you all about them. I'm really pleased and I know that we've got a really exciting one here, but obviously the habitat, we're in Heathland at the mm. minute. I know it's not one that's necessarily, you know, all that fertile. I mean, Heath obviously dominates it, Gorse dominates it. So what have we got? Yeah, so the place we're in is like really sandy. It's really damp. It's really sort of acidic, basically really tough conditions for plants to grow in with very few nutrients in the soil. But what those conditions do provide is really, really excellent conditions for uh, little insects to live. And where little insects arrive, you get things that eat them, of course, as well. And this is one of our predator plants uh, taking on those insects. OK, well, should we uh, get our noses yes, in? Absolutely. I want to see this predator plant for <laughs> myself. What have we got here? So this is called round leaved sundew and its leaf is one of the most beautiful structures in nature. It's just extraordinary. So it's got this lime green leaf covered in red tentacles. Look at that. And each tentacle uh, is sort of tipped with this globule of sticky liquid. Yeah. Um, so it looks like it's kind of covered in dew. Uh, yeah, look at that, you can see it there. It's like glistening the dew. So beautiful, isn't it? Just so unusual to see something like that. Almost looks like an alien. Yeah. Um, and they're really quite small. Um, I think a lot of people think these are quite big and obviously in these images they look quite big. Well, yeah. But actually, they're little plants, but obviously, um, if you're a little insect, they're quite big. Yeah, of course. I mean, I was going to say that because with sundews, you always imagine them to be slightly bigger than mm. they are. But if I put my finger right next to it, like, look, and it's just about as big as my fingernail. I mean, the, the head of it. I mean, with those kind of red tentacles, it is, you know, I mean, it makes the, the, the size of the plant look a little bit bigger. But as you say, if you're a fly, yeah. I mean, that's it's, pretty good. It's the size of a trampoline. It must be absolutely <laughs> terrifying. OK, so tell me about how it works then, because obviously as a predator, it mm. has to be able to consume its prey. Yes. So it kind of acts a bit like fly paper. So um, a fly will come down, land on the leaf and get stuck to the globules of oh, liquid. Oh yeah, okay, we've got a mosquito and there. The leaf starts rolling up, <laughs> like really tightly strangling, uh, in this case, the mosquito. And it's just extraordinary, look at that, it's amazing. It's so cool. Um, terrifying for the mosquito. Uh, but what it does is it releases this sort of cocktail of digestive enzymes, which break down all the soft, juicy, fleshy parts of the mosquito into this sort of root wrigglingly delicious mosquito soup. Yum. Sounds amazing. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, which it then absorbs through the leaf, uses those nutrients to grow, and then unrolls its leaf again, ready to catch its next meal. Of course. I mean, it's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, I just really want to know all about those chemical signals that tell it mm. exactly when to move and how to do it. So it's really clever. Basically, when a fly comes down and lands on the leaf, uh, it gets stuck and it starts freaking out, basically. It panics, uh, it starts struggling, and it's that movement which tells the plant there's something there to eat. And what happens, um, there's basically this amazing piece of research uh, from researchers at the Salk Institute and the University of Washington, where they've used these sort of specially modified glowing oh, yes, sun look at that. And it shows how just a little touch to one of those tentacles sends this kind of wave Whoa. of an electrical signal. Look That's that. alien. Extraordinary. That's so cool. Um, and it's that wave of signaling that goes through the plant that tells it exactly where that insect is. So the plant, when it rolls its leaf up, sort of centers on that point where the insect is, um, making sure it comes into contact with lots of sticky tentacles, really firmly securing it in place and ensuring that it can't escape. Wow. I mean, my mind is just blown. I mean, I, I've known about sun but I've never seen it light up like that. It's so good. It's, it's really cool to see that kind of signalling in action. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm really pleased that you're going to be joining us throughout the series. You can look out on the next few episodes for Leif's contributions, and he's going to be going out all across Arne and obviously around the Isle of Purbeck as well to bring us some of the best plant delights around. And I, for one, cannot wait to learn from you and see all these amazing uh, plants that we really should know and love a little bit more. Now, of course, it is spring watch and we love to bring you the best of wildlife all across the UK. So whilst we're down here on the south coast, I reckon we should take a trip up north to the most northern point of Shetland, where some seabirds are reuniting and getting reacquainted. One of the northernmost extremities of the British Isles where once, around 450 million years ago, continents collided. 
Today, the remnants of tectonic turmoil rise from the Atlantic Ocean. Over 100,000 birds gather here on Herman S to nest in spring. All bringing their own flair. Take the puffin, a creature of habit and high fashion. Sporting a flamboyant new season look, this male is standing proudly at the threshold of his cosy penthouse pad. It's a burrow, potentially an old rabbit hole, reclaimed and repurposed. It's a home he returns to every year, after overwintering from potentially as far as the Bay of Biscay. He'll share it with a female, with whom he has a lifelong bond. But for now, he's alone. She's still en route from her overwintering ground. Many metres below, another male is waiting for his mate to return. A gannet, and they don't do cosy. Perched on the cliff face, this is life on the edge. He's got work to do, grabbing grass and other scraps of vegetation, even collecting seaweed to build a nest which will withstand the punishing wind and rain which regularly lashes the cliff. Job done, he settles down for a well-earned rest. Above, the puffin is also turning in for one more lonely night. Morning brings new arrivals, and among them, our males are the half. Gannets are arriving from even further afield, sometimes as far as Morocco or Senegal. Pairs are reunited, and with families to build, they waste little time getting started. A successful mating, so a single precious egg can be expected in around six weeks. The sky is soon heavy with the colony, heading out en masse to the feeding grounds offshore. And it's now that the gannet reveals the devastating benefit of that sleek physique. The arrowhead bill slices through the surface at speeds of 24 metres a second. Under the water, webbed feet and powerful wing flaps propel the birds to depths of up to 34 metres. The colony is so huge that competition for food is intense. And fights break out. The risk of serious injury is high. Thankfully, not today. Once satisfied, but not too full to fly, the gannets head back to the cliffs before dusk, where, high on the headland, a certain female has found her mate. He comes down to show her to the burrow. And some tender bill fencing reaffirms their pair bond. With the neighbours one step ahead, 
these puffins have some catching up to do. Well, from sea cliffs and seabirds to standing at the edge of a pond, or in a pond, I should say, I'm at Gwythe Powder Nature Reserve run by North Wales Wildlife Trust. And this used to be an explosive factory for almost 150 years. And the water I'm standing in was the water they used to cool down dangerous, complex chemical reactions. Today, it's quite different. It's a real magnet for wildlife. And we've got a couple of volunteers from the Wildlife Trust. We've got Dillis and Iona helping out, getting us some specimens because we really wanted to feature one species that's doing particularly well here. And this is it right here. This, there's a little collection. These are newts, these are palmate newts, a range of uh, specimens here, females, adults, and juveniles as well. And this is absolutely amazing because these are doing incredibly well in great numbers. They're really fascinating animals, strange biology. They can regenerate their limbs. They can pause their life cycle at certain times. They can even skip entire stages of their life cycle. Now, we, I managed to film a few earlier. We had some males as well. And one of the really interesting things about these is they're one of three species of newts that are found in this country, in the UK. And we can look at how different the palmate newts are in in this shot here, you can just about make out there's the male there with those black webbed feet, but also there's some other features that you can see as well. So the newts, they, when you look at their throats, if you ever get a chance to look at them closely, they have no markings on their throat, no spots at all. So that's one feature that's diagnostic. You can see those dark hind feet there of the male, that's the breeding male. The male will also have a tail filament during the breeding season as well. And the breeding female will lack those features, but she will have an orange stripe on the tail. So those are some of the features that you can look out for for these palmate newts. Now they are live up to their amphibious nature. They will move out into the leaf litter in the winter, but in the spring they return to these ponds to breed. Now here at Gwaith, they're doing incredibly well. There's seemingly hundreds of them. We've been able to film them literally just looking down in the water on this wall. And you can see that this isn't a natural environment. You can see that rubble underneath there that was used to build up this pond, but almost hundreds of newts darting in and out of the shadows there. Really beautiful things, fascinating to watch them move under the water. They're lizard-like, but they are amphibians and they will be making the most of this habitat. There you can see one of the juveniles with the external gills as well. So loads of features to pick out when you're looking at these. Now, the interesting thing about their presence here is they're predatory. So that means if they're here in such big numbers, there's plenty for them to eat. And we've had a few specimens just of invertebrates. There are actually quite a few adult beetles here, water boatmen. We've seen earlier, we saw some diving beetles as well. Um, those won't be things on the menu, but they'll certainly go for smaller larvae, things like maybe this dragonfly nymph. It's an early stage larva there. And it'll also go for things like caddisfly larvae, which will be quite small for them, other small beetle larvae. But they'll even go for frog spawn, they'll even go for tadpoles as well. But they don't have it all their own way because their presence attracts yet another predator that's higher up the food train. And just when we arrived a few days earlier to try and get some shots, we hadn't even started setting up, not even the 30 seconds of being here. And this is what we saw. Didn't have time to film it, but we did have a chance to get a quick snap. Now this is a small, possibly juvenile grass snake. And what's interesting about this one is it just cruised straight on by. And the word grass snake is a little bit of of an undersell because these grass snakes actually do really, really well in an aquatic environment. They are strong swimmers. Um, they will head out into the water and you often see them swimming, their bodies undulating underwater, but their heads just above the water. Early in the spring, they'll be looking for mates. At this time, they'll definitely be looking for food. And over here, that means those palmate newts. So it's an amazing environment. It's rich, it's abundant, and it's a little mini ecosystem. And it's really important just to take a moment to remind ourselves that there was a time that there wasn't a single tree here. It was an explosive factory. That would have been a fire risk. So everything you see around here is been here for like 25, 30 years. That is nature bouncing back. And I don't know about you, Chris and Michaela, but I just find that amazing. Not just amazing, I think it's hopeful. It certainly is, Gillian. I love it when nature reclaims places that have been damaged by humanity. 
back here at Arn though. Let's take another look at our range of nests that we've got cameras fixed on at the moment. We've looked at the oyster catcher, we've clearly seen the ospreys and the buzzard. Look, top right, let's go to a new nest, our kestrels. And this is a live shot of the young in the nest there. They've got that thick grey down coat, their second coat, and they're snuggling up together to stay warm because despite the fact it's been sunny down here, it's now very windy and there's a chill on the air. We've been watching these birds though for the last few days. They're in a nest box quite close to our production village. Both of the adults are servicing the young with food. The female seems to be bringing most of it into the nest and tearing it up and feeding it to those chicks, but the male's busy too. Here she is with the juvenile robin, and they've been bringing in a great range of prey, just like the osprey that we saw earlier. She tears it up into small, delicate pieces and feeds it very deliberately and carefully to those chicks. As I say, a range of prey, kestrels will feed on anything from small birds, as we're seeing here, to rodents as well. The male, however, has brought in a sand lizard, a female, and uh, they catch quite a few of these. The lizards are out and about at this time of year looking for places to lay their eggs, and look at that. That is a sand lizard's egg being removed from the body of the adult and fed to a kestrel chick cycle of life if ever I've seen it and they are making a nice meal out of that female sand lizard I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that hey look there the tail is moving around now you know that these tails will thrash about to distract potential predators something called autotomy but that lizard has left it a little bit too late I would uh, beg to suggest to distract the predator at this stage and uh, the youngsters aren't capable of swallowing that tail but the female does. One of the young is considerably smaller than the others, as we can see here. So there are five larger ones and this smaller one, even when it makes its way to the front, it's struggling to get food from the female. You can see there, she's preferentially feeding all of those taller chicks, which are towering above it. And even when she does eventually try to give it some food, it's not very good at swallowing it. So she's giving it some uh, intestine here by the looks of it. And then look, she tries to help it out. In fact, it pulls it out of its mouth and ends up getting given to one of its siblings. So it appears, I'm afraid, Michaela, that we have a little runt in that nest. We do have a runt. And as you can imagine, I was rooting for that runt, as I'm sure most of you at home were as well. But we do have an update. This is something that happened just before we went live. And I do have to warn you here, because this is not an easy watch. It's slightly heartbreaking. But this is what happened. Runty, unfortunately, didn't make it. This is, this is the heartbreaking bit, when you see all the other chicks peck away at it. This is all insurance, isn't it? I mean, six chicks there. It was a lot of mouths to feed. That's why they have so many eggs, because one is highly unlikely not to make it. That one didn't. Um, I, they won't eat it. I mean, it's, it would be very unusual if those chicks actually ate their sibling. It's more likely that one of the adults will come in and remove it from the nest. But what a shame. I was rooting Five for it. Five healthy kestrel it. chicks still going. That's the way you've got to think about it, isn't it, really? That's, uh, as you say, it's an insurance policy having that many in the nest. Anyway, let's move on to a mindfulness moment now. Let's immerse ourselves in the quiet cool of a bubbling brook.
absolutely mesmerised by that dipping dipper, although I'm not sure I should have had that cup Stick of tea. Stick with a terrible. Shouldn't Stick. have that cup of tea before we watched all that running water. I don't want to know about Stick your bladder. Stick with the what? Stick I don't want to know about your bladder. And <laughs> Stick with a terror guide walk. <laughs> Let's have a check out of our live cameras, see if anything in particular is going on. Here we go. Let's have a look at the wall. Oh, we're going to go straight to the Osprey. Oh, look at that. We can see the two chicks there still being fed. And hopefully we will see that third egg hatch. This is really special, though. So much work has gone into getting these ospreys to breed on the south coast. And it, it, we're having a real privilege here watching these two chicks. These will be, if they both survive, so the second good. lot of chicks. Second lot of chicks, yeah. Be born fantastic. on the Dorset coast. Long way to go, though, Michaela. Long way to go. Long way to go. Not all about right. birds, though. We've got some deer, seeker deer here, I think, are they? Let's have a look. It's quite windy down on the marshes here at Arne at the moment, and there they are out there in that lush green grass, grazing. Lovely sight. We actually saw them earlier, didn't we? Just behind us here. Yeah. They were sort of in the water. Quite a significant population of seeker deer here. Introduced species, of course. Hey, what about this as a photograph? Marsh Harriers, food passing in North Norfolk, taken by Ricky Sinfield. Pretty special, that one, I'd say. We've had a lot of gory stuff tonight, so I'm going to show you something really cute that you will love. Look at this. Fox cubs. Oh, my goodness. Tom Murphy, you have excelled yourself with this. Look at them on a beach. I mean, that's not the normal place that you'd see them. But look at that little face. Frolicking in slow motion. <laughs> you, hey? you don't get better than that. That's cheered me up. After the dead There's only one trick, thing better than that. Poodles <laughs> frolicking in slow motion. That's absolutely sensational. <laughs> We're not the only one they've been focusing on uh, reptiles, though. Have a look at this. Here is a coot pecking at the tail of a grass snake. Richard Harrison took this. Of course, the grass snake could have been after the coot's young, because they will eat them. A whole mass of slow worms here. Mark Halson took this. There are some youngsters in amongst it. Golden needles, we told them. They must have been under something. I imagine he's lifted a log to Looks reveal that aggregation of slow worms. Looks like spaghetti then... bolognese, that, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not eating around your place. Um, Ada here. Um, John Spooner took this picture of an adder. What a beautiful animal the adder is. We certainly hope to be catching up with those at some point here at Arne. And I don't mean finding a shed skin. A mysterious <laughs> shed skin that just got left in the field. Keep sending your photos in, though, as you know, we love to see them. That's all we've got time for. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll be introducing you to another family of foxes, this family here up in Scotland, and we'll be following those for a few days. And I'll be looking up to the sky for the bird with the biggest wingspan. I'll be catching up with those pied flycatchers who, when it comes to mating behaviour, let's just say it's complicated. We'll be back at 8 o'clock tomorrow. In the meantime, you can watch our live cameras, see if that third osprey chick hatches. And I'll be with Hannah Stipfel tomorrow at 1 o'clock for Watch Out on all our social media channels. Keep sending all your photographs in. It's a beautiful evening, so get out, enjoy the sunset, have a great day tomorrow. We'll be back at 8 o'clock to bring you loads more fabulous spring wildlife. See you then. Bye-bye. What can you do to make a difference to nature and the environment? Well, sometimes big changes come from small actions. The Open University explores simple but effective ways to make a positive impact. To get inspired, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash springwatch and follow the links to the Open University.